and friends. Just give the fire a little poke. It's definitely that time of the year. Nothing like the crackle of a fire to really, you know, sets the ambiance for the saw shop. How's everybody doing today? You guys can hear the crackle, I hope, of a nice fire. I'm burning uh, spruce and poplar, all the real good, you know, the choice wood. <laughs> I don't dare burn oak or anything ash this time of the year. It just gets too hot in here. That old woodsman wood stove just belts the heat out. Um, that stove heated like a 1200 square foot house. Uh, my grandmother and grandfather's house. My grandfather actually built that house in, I might be wrong, um, 71 or 72, he built that house. So pretty neat. Um, that was the, that stove was the focal point of that basement throughout my childhood. We'd go there for Christmas and that thing would be just crackling away. Um, of course, as, as time goes and, and uh, more and more rules and regulations get in. You, you can't certify a stove like that anymore. So it's good for the little workshop here, but um, it, it can't go in a house. So um, in, in this jurisdiction, I got dirt in my eye today, friends. You know, it's cold out. I got the, uh, I got the Husky, Husqvarna quilted hat on. My good friend, uh, Mr. Buckin sent me this hat. Hey buddy, styling and profiling. <laughs> Anyhow, friends, a couple things I wanted to touch on. There was some little, there was quite a bit of questioning about the timing on the intake of uh, the Titan nickel cylinder. Um, friends, I was just misreading the wheel. What 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 actually happens sometimes? I normally I don't comment on stuff like this, but friends, I got so much feedback on that. I was like, I didn't even realize I did it. Uh, I edited the video. Here's the thing though, friends, I pre-time my cylinders before I shoot them quite often just to see where they are because in the, in the interest of time, I don't want to do a 49 minute video of me going, is that open? You, you guys know what I'm saying? Um, so a lot of times I will, I will see where the timing numbers are about, write it down, and then I could quickly and effectively show you guys what's going on. Well, what I did was I turned the wheel and uh, I was looking down at it and I was just putting it in the wrong spot. So 72 was the number. That means you guys are learning. So you guys picked up on that and, and that's good. That means a lot of you guys are learning. Um, even if it was 68, um, that wouldn't have really affected anything. Um, if I measured when I was grinding, which I did, I would never, if I added five degrees, say, Say it was 72 and I wanted 77. If I added five degrees, I would lower the intake on this saw about 50 thousandths. I would measure 50 thousandths and make a line and grind to there. Well, if it was 70 or if it was 68 and I added five, it would only be 73. When I retimed the cylinder, um, I would have seen that my timing numbers are off. So um, it's always good to recheck. Everybody makes mistakes, including me. I do it all the time. Sometimes you just misread a wheel or or uh, your zero wasn't quite right. And that's why I tell you guys, recheck your zero, recheck your numbers. You won't make mistakes then. So um, that's the deal there. Again, this is the first Titan nickel cylinder I have used. I am very impressed with it. Um, some of you guys ask, why don't you use OEM? I have used OEM in the past. A lot of these cylinders are not no longer available, friends. You can't get them anymore. So. If you if you want to if you're interested in vintage saws, I don't think you can get a 272 top end from Husqvarna anymore, and I'm 99.9% .9 sure you can't get a 266 or 268. You have to remember they haven't made this saw in I think the 92, so um, 30 years. Um, so when it comes to stuff like this, you're you're just not getting OEM. So uh, also. I have, honestly, friends, if these if these cylinders weren't good or I didn't believe in them, I wouldn't use them. I would I would figure out something. I've had good luck with Meteor. Um, Meteor is a quality cylinder. I like the timing numbers better on the highway for porting reasons. Um, I mean, if you don't want highway, get Meteor. It would be my, you know what I mean? One or the other. Um, I have used Farmer Tech. You guys ask me all the time. I don't really like FarmerTech cylinders. 
I've had no trouble with them, friends. I built many MS-260s with FarmerTech cylinders. They ran. Uh, they didn't go into a commercial cutting setting, though. They, they went to firewood guys that cut a cord a year, maybe. So I don't think those would last in the long term. And the port heights are just all over the place on those. So, um, But for the price, like, you can buy a FarmerTech cylinder for, what, 25 30 bucks. If you got a cheap saw and you just want to play with porting, by all means. Um, but really, for the quality, the hardness of the plating, etc. I mean, friends, these things are nice. Um, they really are. The first time I looked at one of these, when you guys saw me on video, that was the first time when I unboxed this. These things are gorgeous. So, um, we're going to try it out. Um, if I have any problems, I will tell you guys. Um, you know, right now, from my point of view, these, my cost on these, if I was buying them just over the counter, is like, especially for stills, like stills up here uh, in Canada, if you want a still top end, you can pay like five or six hundred dollars, friends, for piston and cylinder. That's too much money for me. Um, it, uh, it, it takes this hobby and, and makes it not as fun. If you're a commercial cutter, yeah, I get it. If, if that's a money-making saw. But I'm just farting around in my shop. And uh, I like to get these things running at a price point that doesn't, you know. So, anyhow, friends, um, what are we doing today? I got to rebuild this carburetor. And I want to see if we can get this saw running, assembled. I still haven't modded the muffler. I'm probably going to run this in with the stock muffler. These are quite open. In fact, I can see you guys through there right now. Um, I want to see what this is going to do with the stock muffler before we attempt to mod it. Usually how I mod these is I will fish kill them right here. I'll cut a slot and I just, I, I, I slowly mold it and bend it out with a pair of pliers and just make a nice round fish kill. And that usually wakes these things right up. Okay. So... Okay, friends, I'm going to get you guys set up here, and uh, let's take this carb apart, and we'll put a carb kit in it. Make sure that it looks good inside. You never know if a carb's going to run until you try it, so um, I typically have no trouble with these Tillotsons. They're they're very, very reliable carbs. Um, they're, they're good, and if you want to work on vintage saws, get familiar with these, because around here... 80% of the saws that come through the shop have these HS series carburetors in various sizes. Um, they made dozens and dozens and dozens of different varieties of these carbs. So um, most of the saws in the shop have a version of an HS. So this is the carb that I spend the most time inside. Okay, enough flopping. We will get this rocking and rolling. Just give me a few minutes to get set up here. Okay, friends. So this is a Tillotson. HS 234B, um, 268s had these, later 266s. So on these 200 series Huskies, you know, your uh, 61s, 162s, early 266s, you could tell an early 266 by the cylinder code. Um, they are 50ZN11, that is an early 266. Um, if it's a 50 ZN, what is it, 13? <coughs> Excuse me, friends. If it's a 50 ZN 13, that is a late 266. If it's a 50 ZN 14, that is a 268, okay? Uh, I get asked that quite often. So one, the 162B is the early carb. So you can tell if you have an early saw based on that. Now there's other... There's other things that make an early saw. I think I'm going to do another 200 series video. Um, a friend of this channel who uh, who is just a good fella and helps us out uh, sent me a bunch of saw carcasses and parts. And uh, I have a good selection of the different, the different models of this chassis now that I can kind of go over with you guys. Okay, so first thing. This is your pump side, okay? Right here, friends, you see this? Okay, this, let's see if I can hold this up and you guys can see it. Let's make sure we got you guys here. Okay, you guys see this? See how that flap is up? These have to be flush against the body of the carburetor, okay? That flaps up, 
So right there, we know this this carb wouldn't have run. I know sometimes you, it's like I want to get I want to run the saw. To me, it's not worth it. It's better off to just put a carb kit in it. See, and these are hard as a rock. Okay, these these open and close with the pulse, right? So right there, this thing wouldn't have run. And again, they were starting to break down. We have some. We have some of the diaphragms that are stuck there. I will clean that up. Okay, so that's your pump side. This is your metering side, and I show this often. This metering diaphragm, listen. It's hard. When they click like that, they're not soft. You want these to be pliable. Okay, now, when you're pulling these HS carbs apart, I don't know if you guys can see that. See the little... See the little nub there? See? It hooks on. It hooks on to here. If you put one of these together, there, look. Okay? You can put this together like that without hooking it in. Now, what actually happens there, oh, this one hooked it on its own. But often, and I've seen this, you put a carb together like this and you don't hook it in. What that does is this little nub here. Okay, pushes down on the metering lever and holds it open, okay, slightly down. See that? Your saw will flood horribly. Sometimes they won't even run. Sometimes they'll sit there and spit fuel out of the carb. Now again, this is your metering lever. This is what controls how much fuel the carburetor gets, okay? And it opens and closes. You want to make sure that it doesn't stick. Now I find some of the older models of this carb, I think this bore in here, where the bottom of the needle sits gets like a burr in it and these get stuck. I have, I've had a couple of saws with carbs. If you let the saw sit for a couple weeks, they will not fire. Squirt a little fuel into the carb. Once it fires, it's like it gets enough vacuum to pull this open and then the saw runs. So if you have that problem, you might have a worn out carb. Okay. The height of this, this model, this should be flush with here okay can you guys see that okay if you if it's too high too much fuel if it's too low like that not enough fuel it'll run lean the symptom of too much fuel in one of these often they're too high when you you tune the saw it runs good maybe a little lazy a little rich on the bottom end when you throw the saw down and let it idle it'll go Bop, 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 bop. It might take a minute for it to do that. That's loading up. You're getting too much fuel into the bottom end and it's not burning it and it just chokes the saw out. If that is your problem, go in here and just lower this a hair, okay? Often it'll be too high. Okay, so that's what we got going on here. You can buy one of these carb tools. Um, these actually, these aren't quite... Um, like this is a Walboro tool. This one here doesn't work for these. If you set it up with this, it's just a hair too high, but it'll work. Okay. And this has all the different models on it. Okay. I'm going to take the metering lever out. I don't take the screw all the way out usually. And I'll turn this sideways. There you go. There's your needle. That's usually rubber on the bottom and that's what seals off. Okay. I'll often inspect these. This one's not too bad. It's got a little ring around it. I usually reuse the factory spring on these. And then again, look through here. You guys see that? Make sure that that hole has no obstructions in it. Okay? You wanna make sure that, that it's not plugged. If this is plugged, you won't get any fuel. Okay, what happens is it lets fuel in here, and then it gets pulled into the carburetor. Now, why do saws use these kind of carburetors? Because you, you can run them on their side. If you had a standard carb with a float and a bowl, the floats go like this, right? It would be this way, up and down, and the float opens. If you run it on its side, that float might not open, you might not get any fuel. Or it might hang open and the, the fuel will actually um, flood the saw. So that's why carbs on saws are built like this. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to clean all this up. I'm going to spray some carb cleaner through this saw. Make sure that all the 
all the little uh, orifices in that are clear. This screen right here, that's your inlet side. The screen is bone dry, clean. There's really nothing in there, okay? If that's dirty, they give you a new screen in this kit. You want to press that in so that it sits straight. Okay, this carb's actually in good shape. It's just, it's a little dirty, not the worst I've seen. I'm just gonna clean it out. Okay, I got the carb all cleaned up. Just making sure that all the mating surfaces are, are clean. Uh, I took both jets out one at a time and uh, sprayed carb cleaner in there and made sure you could see it coming through the jets in the bore of the carb. Everything's good, doesn't seem to be any obstructions there. Um, so I'm going to reuse this spring. I'm going to get rid of this metering lever and needle. Here's my new carb kit. This is just a generic aftermarket carb kit. I'm not sure where I got it from. Uh, I'll have to look. I order these because they come with two of these gaskets and these fit McCullough's and a couple, there's some home lights also. Uh, they fit them perfectly. And I just, I just take them out and put them in a little bag. Okay, and save them for later. They, I, they don't work on this saw. Okay, now, if you've never done one of these before, this is usually why saws don't run, especially if they've been sitting. Line up your, your gasket. Okay, here's your, here's your diaphragm. Okay, make sure that they are the same. Now, I know these are because I've used tons of them, but if you get a new kit, try that out. I'm going to use the rubber pump diaphragm these are for ethanol fuel now we do have ethanol fuel here a lot of what i run is ethanol fuel it's just what's available to me i've never had a problem and i think it's because i use that opti 2 oil uh it has really good fuel stabilizers i've have saws here that have the same fuel in them for a year or two and i can literally pull them over and they flash right away and they run fine so i think that's why i don't have any problems okay check my new needle and it is the same as the old one okay metering lever and the pin there okay uh, i'm not changing any of the screens in here and these welsh plugs these are good for blocking off governors but uh i'm not going to be using those so i'll take this out of here take the old parts throw them in the g file for garbage okay so usually what i start with is the needle and metering lever, okay? Let's see if I can get you guys in here. I'll zoom you guys in a bit, okay? So let me get you guys here, okay? Now, what I do here, friends, you can tell I've been spraying brake clean, okay? I put this pin through there, okay? And I usually start it like that, so it's sticking out on one side. Then I grab my new needle, hook it in there, okay? And now, this is where the fun comes, especially if you got the sausage fingers like I do. Okay. Oh. Again, everything goes smooth so you film it. You guys that YouTube know what I'm talking about. Okay. And what I do is, I get it going in there. Okay, I lay it in there. Okay, we're fighting with this one a little bit. Okay, see that? And now it's just going to sit in there. The spring is underneath that little nub there. Notice my screw's in there, so all I got to do is push down on that with my thumb. Now I hold it in place here, and then I go like this. This can be really fumbly when you first start. That's the way I do it, and I just find I never take this screw all the way out. Just cinch it down. Now you guys will notice this metering lever is probably bang on. It's a little tweaked in the one corner. There you guys go. Okay, I'm going to hold it down with my finger. I'm just going to curl that side up. Okay. Might be slightly higher than stock, the way this one was, but I think the one that was in here was a little low for my liking. And again, opens and closes, okay? Now, on this side, on this side, it's gasket first. Okay. Gasket first, diaphragm second, diaphragm goes on top. And again, lay that little nub, okay? Lay that little nub into that little space right here. Put it in there and click it on, see? Okay, 
we'll get this okay so I just lay it on there and it clicks into the end of the metering lever I think you guys get the idea first time I did one of these I didn't hook it in and uh, the saw spit fuel everywhere and I had nothing but trouble after that okay I got it in place now I'm gonna do this carefully listen you can hear the needle and seat opening and closing but not that crinkle sound like it's crinkly okay Okay, I'll put the screws back on. That's how you do this side of the carburetor. And that's all HS carbs. Doesn't matter if it's on a home light. Once in a while you'll get one that doesn't have that center nub. Um, one of my buddies, I can't remember who, asked me about that. He's working on a saw and it's like, yeah, sometimes you get these carbs with a carb kit that don't have the nub on them. That hooks in, it just sits on top. That is a thing. Some HS carburetors have that. Okay, there's that side. Try not to reef these down, just snug. It won't leak. Okay, and here's the other side. I buffed it up with some Scotch-Brite. Get you guys kind of set up here. Knock my uh, table over. Okay, this side, this side, the, the diaphragm goes on the face of the carburetor. And you can see there's two holes, it blocks those holes, okay? So again, notice how it lays flat now on the body of the carb. The old one, they were curled up. Okay, now these are pretty easy. There's this chamber here. Lay this down. That chamber lines up with a hole. Okay. Right here. Lay this down on there. There's our gasket. Again, the chamber's here. There you go. Put some screws down. We have a fully rebuilt carburetor. That's it. That's 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 literally as long as it takes. Um, most times these carbs aren't too dirty. When I get them, they're usually pretty clean. They don't hold much fuel, so when the fuel, if the fuel goes bad, um, I don't find it's like the you know I don't find it's a huge job to clean them. Um, again, though, I come from motorcycles. When you have a motorcycle that's been sitting for 25 years and the float bowls were full, full. See, it's a four cylinder Japanese bike or something. That's quite the, the, the chore to clean those. Often they have brass floats in them and. Okay, there you go. Fully rebuilt carb. Okay, friends, I really wanted to detail the carb build. Um, carburetor issues with these style of carbs are super common. Any of you guys that have played with saws know that often a bad running saw the first place you go is the carburetor so i wanted to show a very detailed rebuild um especially of these hs series there's a lot of these around like in this shop i probably have you know 40 or 50 of these carburetors um some on saws some off but they're just so common uh home light use them um, Husqvarna used them for years and years and years and, and various other saws. Uh, the Pioneers used them. There's so many saws that have the HS Tillotson. I love a Tilly carburetor. Um, they fuel really well. They're easy to work on. Parts are available. And um, you can make some pretty serious horsepower with this carburetor. And, uh, and uh, you know, they, they go... How do I, how do I want to say this? They vary in size enough that you can usually, these don't get really big. Like if you're building a, you know, the biggest saw that I know of with one of these is like a 288, I think would be the saw, right? But 288 all the way down to like a 60cc saw, all you can run these. So if you're porting saws, you can often, especially Husqvarna's, you can find the right carburetor for what you want to do. So, um, anyhow, friends. We are very close to having this saw running. Um, I think it's going to be a good runner, and uh, I'm really excited to get this thing rocking and rolling. This is a totally different build from what I do. Um, 99 degrees on the exhaust roof, that's a really solid number. This thing should pull a 32 pretty hard. Um, with big transfers, it, it just goes to show I, I'm trying to prove out theories. I'm always working on stuff to prove theories to me. Um, 
the more air you can get these things flowing, the more power they're going to make. And uh, if if you if you keep a low exhaust roof and move lots of air, they're still going to pull good RPM, and they're still going to be really hard charging saws. So. Um, I think we have a winning package here. I won't know until I run it though. These timing numbers are totally different than what I've run on previous 272s that you've seen on this channel. I've been all over the map trying to find the sweet spot for 272s. I like them with a high exhaust roof for around here. They're really, really zippy. Being a short stroke overboard saw, meaning it has a large bore to stroke ratio, they're very zippy and very fast. So if you're in 18 inch and under wood, uh, uh, a high strung port of 272 really, really um, makes quick work. If you're in bigger wood and you have overbore short stroke, uh, you tend to want a lower exhaust roof because they, um, they drop torque off so rapidly with a short stroke when you start getting up there. Now, there are other ways to feed a saw more torque. You saw Buckins 266. That has a high exhaust roof, a pop-up. Um, this build should be torquier than that one, but that one runs at several thousand more RPM than this one should. So, um, again, everybody has a different way of porting, and whatever works for you is what... I can't tell you what to do with your saw. I can only show you guys what I do with mine. Um, my saws typically run at a high speed. You got to have a sharp chain with them. And, um, I don't lean on saws. I never, I never lean on a saw. I believe a saw should pull itself through the wood. Um, so I don't tend to build saws that are super grunty down low or it, because I don't, I don't like to lean on a saw. So, um, some people, some people prefer to lean on a saw and they build for that. And again, it's just different styles of cutting. So. Anyhow, friends, we're one step closer. Uh, I'm super glad that you guys can join me for this project, and uh, I can't wait. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to put the saw together. I'm probably going to show you the build in real time. I'll, I'll clip out, you know, the boring parts, but I think I'm just going to show you the build in real time and do a voiceover of exactly what I'm doing, and you guys can see about how long it takes to, to assemble one of these saws. Anyhow, friends. As always, thanks for watching. Take her easy.